There was a news story that caught my attention this week. It was sort of a secondary story to a major story that caught the news, and it was out of Utah. And the story was a, really an interview with the boss of a man named Dwayne Yao. Dwayne Yao, 47 years old, was employed by a uh, engineering firm in Salt Lake City, Utah, as a corporate pilot. Last Sunday evening, he was arrested uh, on a domestic violence charge. He had been drinking along with his wife. He was taken into custody around 7.30 in the evening. Around midnight that night, he was released. Police officer took him to his home. He got his pickup truck. He got some personal effects and he left. What happened next was what made national news. Mr. Yowd went to the airport where the corporate jet was hangered. He used his access code to go into the hangar, access the jet, took off, and flew the jet into his own home, killing himself. His wife and his son escaped without any injuries, really miraculously, and most all of the damage was uh, just in that one home in that neighborhood. He missed some power lines. They said really he showed his skill as a pilot in his ability to only hit that home. The home was engulfed in flames when firefighters responded. But in the article by the Associated Press, Leon Van Sickle, the president of VanCon Incorporated, said this, said, he talked about Yao's access to the, the plane and the hangar, but he said Yao had, was a, a stellar pilot who flew employees to business meetings around North America in the company's only plane, a twin engine Cessna. Van Sickle said he, he's the manager of the plane. He had full access to it. It all boils to trust. And I don't know what we would have done differently. He said he flies with our lives at stake and we thoroughly trusted him beyond measure. He took great care of us. He never took chances. Everything was by the book. That struck me as interesting that this man, Mr. Van Sickle said that the pilot was the manager of the plane because as the story began to progress, the question came, well, whose plane is it? And it came out that it wasn't the pilot's plane, but it was owned by a corporation. And so then people said, well, how did this guy get access to it? How could he steal essentially this plane and then crash it into his own home? And what the president said of this company was, listen, he was the manager of the plane. He was the guy in charge of the plane. And you can imagine what would happen that, that the pilot would get a call and they would say, hey, we want to go from here to there and this is the time in which we want to do it. And so that was his job. He would go and he would prepare the plane. He would gas the plane. He would do a safety check of the plane and then he would fly the plane. And so instead of doing his job as normal, he took the access that he had and took his own life in a tragic way, seemingly with the intent of harming others also, and thank God that didn't happen. And I thought about that story in relationship to the story we're looking at this morning out of Luke chapter 16 and verse number one. If you remember in Luke 15, Jesus tells the story of the lost sheep tells the story of the lost coin. And then he tells the very powerful story of the, the lost son, the prodigal son, the one who goes away but comes back again. And in that story of the prodigal son, the imagery is very easy for us. The father who stands at the, at the, on the porch, if you will, looking for his son and runs to him when, when the son makes a move to him, 
That's, that's God. We see that very clearly. And those who would go away from God and, and who would be in the muck and the mire and will have wasted everything and, and turn towards God and come to him, the, that prodigal son is often us. And, and so we, we see that imagery. This morning we're gonna look at a story that doesn't have that easy kind of imagery. Not at all. In Luke chapter 16, beginning in verse number one, Jesus, who had previously told those earlier stories to the Pharisees and the crowds that were around, now he tells a story to his disciples, to his followers. He said there was a certain rich man who had a manager handling his affairs. One day a report came that the manager was wasting his employer's money. So the employer called him in and said, what's this I hear about you? Get your report in order because you're going to be fired. The manager thought to himself, now what? My boss has fired me. I don't have the strength to dig ditches and I'm too proud to beg. Ah, I know how to ensure that I will have plenty of friends who will give me a home when I'm fired. So he invited each person who owed money to his employer to come and discuss the situation. He asked the first one, how much do you owe him? The man replied, I owe him 800 gallons of olive oil. So the manager told him, take the bill and quickly change it to 400 gallons. And how much do you owe my employer? He asked the next man. I owe him 1,000 bushels of wheat was the reply. Here the manager said, take the bill and change it to 800 bushels. The rich man had to admire the dishonest rascal for being so shrewd. And it is true that the children of this world are more shrewd in dealing with the world around them than are the children of the light. Here's the lesson, Jesus said. Use your worldly resources to benefit others and make friends. Then when your possessions are gone, they will welcome you to an eternal home. If you are faithful in little things, you will be faithful in large ones. But if you are dishonest in little things, you won't be honest with greater responsibilities. And if you are untrustworthy about worldly wealth, you will, who will trust you with the true riches of heaven? If you are not faithful with other people's things, why should you be trusted with things of your own? No one can serve two masters, for you will hate one and love the other. You will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. And so Jesus tells the story of what I'm calling the shrewd or, or perhaps uh, the, the unrighteous steward. And we see, first of all, his failure. We see that, that, that he was a manager, but a report comes to the, the owner that says, your manager's not doing right by you. Now, what's interesting is we're not told who gave the report. We don't know if, if, if maybe it was a person who uh, owed the, the manager or, or the master. Uh, we're not sure uh, if it was maybe another employee of the master. We don't know. But the implication is this guy was a mess. I mean, it's interesting what the master says. He says, get your report in order you're fired. He doesn't say get your report in order and try to save your job. Right? He, say, he, he, he already lets him know this is not going to end well for you. See, a manager, his main job is faithfulness. Matter of fact, stewardship is sort of the church word, the, the Bible word that we talk about. And it's the idea that as managers of what God has given us, we're to be faithful. First Corinthians chapter four and verse two says, now a person who was put in charge as a manager must be faithful. But this man's reputation was bad. And so he's going to be fired. What he does next is very interesting. It is not the example that Jesus is holding up to us. It's important for us to understand when we're talking about imagery, it's not like, well, be like this manager. This manager is called wicked. So obviously that's not what Jesus is telling us to do, but he is telling us a story to give us 
an illustration. It's interesting also, the New Living Translation uses the term shrewd. That's a word that is used today, but it has a lot of different connotations. I looked it up. Here's, what it, here's some uh, synonyms for shrewd. Abusive, dangerous, mischievous, all things that have a negative connotation. But then there are synonyms that have a positive connotation. Astute, perceptive, farsighted. In other words, not a physical deformity, but that you're looking ahead. Wise, clever in judgment, discerning. Sometimes shrewd in business is a compliment. It's, oh, well, that guy, he sees what others doesn't see. He's able to make moves kind of ahead of, of people. But oftentimes, it's a negative. And here, certainly, it's looked at in a negative way. The manager thought to himself, now what? My boss has fired me. I don't have the strength to dig ditches, and I'm too proud to beg. He certainly makes a very honest appraisal of himself, doesn't he? Well, I'm too weak to dig ditches. I can't do physical labor. That's not what this manager was about, right? He was, he was lending money to people. He was getting interest back. He was managing the affairs of the master, but he sure wasn't uh, getting his hands dirty. And he said, I can't do that. And they said, I'm too proud to beg. So he hatches a plan. The Greek says about this man, the Greek word that's used about the manager is unjust, unrighteous, or wicked. He invites the people in that owe money. He says, how much did you owe? Well, I owed a thousand gallons of olive oil. Obviously, they didn't measure in gallons, but that's the equivalent. And he said, well, here, why don't you write out 500 gallons? That'll be your bill. What do you owe? Well, I owe 1,000 bushels of wheat. Write out 800. There are several reasons why this might be done. As I read different commentators and kind of tried to study about the culture there, there were several reasons why this might be done. It's interesting. One, the, the, the manager had the debtor write out the bill. He created co-conspirators in this. Remember what his goal is. His goal is to have a place to land, right? When he's fired, his goal is to have people who will help him out. But it benefited the, the people who were in debt to the master. One commentator I read said that the manager surely was a politician because he was very generous with other people's money. I thought that was humorous as well. So he was creating co-conspirators. Also, the manager could be charged with a crime and could, if he, if he was found to be an unjust manager, he might be liable for the debts that the, that the master had. Well, he lowered those, didn't he? Because the bill wasn't 1,000 gallons, it was 500. And one would assume that the debtors would be more likely to pay now because they owed less. What he did is not an example for us. I want to be clear. I don't want you leaving today going, well, preacher said, if you can get away with it, man. <laughs> Cha-ching. Not the message this morning. But the manager was being true to his character. He was, why was he being fired? He was a dishonest manager. It wasn't just that he was a poor manager, he was a dishonest manager. He was taking the master's money and using it in a dishonest way, we would assume, for his own gain. And then he does, he comes up with another scheme to try to 
further himself now that he's going to be fired. Paul in Philippians chapter three and verse 17 says this, writing to the church of Philippi, he says, dear brothers and sisters, pattern your lives after mine and learn from those who follow our example. For I've told you often before, and I say it again with tears in my eyes, that there are many whose conduct shows they are really enemies of the cross of Christ. They are headed for destruction. Their God is their appetite. They brag about shameful things and they think only about this life here on earth. But Paul said, we are citizens of heaven where the Lord Jesus Christ lives and we are eagerly waiting for him to return as our savior. We will take our weak mortal bodies and change them into glorious bodies like his own using the same power with which he will bring everything under his control. Paul said, listen, there are those who only think about this world. There are those who only follow their appetites, but that's not who you ought to be as followers of Jesus Christ. You need to follow my example. You need to be looking for eternal things. And that is the message that Jesus had in Luke chapter 16 in verse number nine, when he said this to his disciples, he tells them this story. Now to me, the story of the prodigal son is easily understood and it's easily applied. Think about the story of the great good Samaritan, right? A man asks, who's my neighbor? And Jesus tells the story. A man went down and he fell amongst thieves. He was beaten, he was robbed, he was left for dead. The priest came by, the Levite came by, they passed by on the other side, but the Samaritan came. He helped the man, he bound up his wounds, he took him to the inn. And then Jesus said, who's his neighbor? Well, it's obvious, isn't it? The Samaritan was the neighbor. The Samaritan was the one who helped out the man. And then our job is to go and do that. I'm not saying it's an easy principle, but it's easy to understand. This seems different though. Jesus tells this story about this guy who was wicked to start with and then did a wicked thing to try to get out of the trouble he was in. So if I'm his disciples, I'm sitting there going, what does that have to do with us? I imagine Judas was making applications. He kept the money back, but that's not supposed to be our example either, right? Here's the lesson Jesus said. Use your worldly resources to benefit others and make friends. Then when your possessions are gone, they will welcome you to an eternal home. If you are faithful in little things, you will be faithful in large ones. But if you are dishonest in little things, you won't be honest with greater responsibilities. And if you are untrustworthy about worldly wealth, who will trust you with the true riches of heaven. See, Jesus was not just talking about how to handle your business here on earth, but he's talking about earthly things and spiritual things. And he's taking the story of this dishonest manager and he's saying, but here's how you ought to live. And the first thing I see is how we use our resources. He says, use your worldly resources to benefit others and make friends. We need to use what God has given us as a benefit to others. Well, what has God given us? Three things I think God blesses us with from scripture. Number one, time, time. See, this message this morning is not all about money. Money is part of it, but money's not the only thing we have because sometimes it's easier to throw money at a situation than it is to really get involved. Listen. We've got them all over in Denver, right? On, on every major corner, somebody's there with a sign or something asking for money. But I'll tell you the truth. It's easier to roll down your window and hand that person some money than it is to get involved in their life. It just is. That's a clean transaction, right? I can, maybe I take a $5 bill and I hand that and I feel better about myself and I feel like, well, I've done a good deed for the day. I don't know if that really had an impact on that person's life or not. 
God has given us time. Ephesians chapter five and verse 15 says, New King James says, see then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. Verse 16, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Do not be drunk with wine, which is dis dissipation, but be filled with the spirit. E Ephesians says, redeem the time. Scripture tells us that it's appointed unto man once to die. God knows how long we have here on earth. We have a finite amount of time and we have been given that and we are to be good managers of the resources that God has given to us. Listen, as I studied this passage this week, this was the area that God sort of gives me the gut punch about the most. Because I realize that if I'm not careful, I can waste time. I waste time doing so many other things that have no eternal value whatsoever. Now I understand that we all have to do things that might not be important, but we gotta do them anyway. Listen, you've got to go, if you, sometimes you have to go to the DMV. Sometimes you gotta go there, right? You gotta get plates, get a new vehicle, something. You have to go to the DMV. I hate going to the DMV. You know, you, you go up, the, the one I go to has a little kiosk, and you pick what you need to do, and it spits out the little ticket, you know, and it'll say, R341. And you're like, okay, R341. Then you look up, and it's like, R11. Report to, and you're like, no! And then I start looking around, because I always think, maybe somebody got sick of waiting, and they just left their ticket laying around. And I've prayed before I go in, Lord, let me find R13 laying on that bench. And then I have other thoughts too. I'm just telling you at the DMV, sometimes there'll be an old person there and they'll be holding things. I'm like, I wonder if I could just switch. I've never done that. I'm just telling you, these things come in my mind. Look over there. I... <laughs> You're just upset you didn't think about it. That's, of course, that's not right. But man, you can spend hours in there, right? And you feel like, what a waste of time. Traffic and lines and get the run around on different things. I don't, I don't know what it is for you, but I mean, we all have those experiences. And I understand that in our life, we can't spend all day every day just praying and reading our Bible. I, I get that. We have jobs and we have work and we have obligations. But in the midst of that, I think we forget sometimes that we are managers of the time that God has given to us. And we need to be good and faithful managers to do things and invest our time in things that have eternal value. That's why I think coming to church is important. In the course of our week, it's a relatively small investment of time and we work and hopefully you feel like it is a good investment of your time. But it's more than just coming to church. It is spending time in God's word. It is spending time with God in prayer. But it's also having conversations that have eternal value. It's also in investing in other people for the purpose of showing them the love of God. And if we're not careful, we cannot do important things because we just don't have the time because we're doing urgent things and busy things. But some of the resources we have are time. Not only that, but we have talent. First Peter chapter four and verse 10 says, God has given each of you a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. Use them well to serve one another. Listen, all of us have talent. 
You might be here this morning and say, wow, preacher, I don't have any talent. God has given each of you a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. Use them well to serve one another. Doesn't say we get to pick the gift, and sometimes we like to emphasize one gift over another, but all of us have talents that God desires to use, gifts that God has given to us. And I'm reminded, one of my favorite illustrations or stories of this is found in Exodus chapter four. You remember Exodus chapter four, and I'll not take the time to read it this morning, but Moses, all of Exodus three is the encounter with Moses at the burning bush. He grows up in the home of Pharaoh. He he's, ends up on the backside of the desert. He's tending his sheep and he sees a bush that burns and is not consumed. So he goes to it and there he has an encounter with God. God says, take off your shoes. You're on holy ground. And he begins to lay out for him. I'm going to send you back to Egypt. You're going to be the, the, the leader, the catalyst to let my people be freed from slavery and, and to come out of Egypt. And he hears all of this, and in Exodus chapter four, Moses protests again. In Exodus three, God has already said, Moses said, well, who should I tell him? And he said, I am that I am. God has already made this great declarative statement in Exodus three, I am. I am all you need, I am all powerful, I am almighty God. And still in Exodus four, Moses is like, I don't know. And so God says this, hey Moses, what's in your hand? And you know what he was holding? A stick, a shepherd's staff. He says, throw it down, and he threw it down and it became a snake. And he said, pick it up. And if I was Moses, I'd have been like, I'm good. (laughs) Staffs are easy to find but he picked it up by a tail, and as he grabbed that snake by the tail, it became a stick again. And that stick, that rod, became the instrument that God used over and over as the symbol of his power. He would take that rod and touch it to a rock, and the rock split, and water came from it when the people of Israel and their cattle and and their herds were dying of thirst, and water gushed from the rock. He would take that staff, and he would hold it up, and a sea would part. He would put it down, and the sea would come together, and an army would be destroyed. He would take that staff, and he would hold it up with his arms, and the, the, the victory would be won by the nation of Israel. And as his arms grew tired and they came down, they would begin to lose the battle so that men would come and they would hold the arms of Moses up. And that staff became the symbol of God's power. And what was so special about it? Nothing, but it was what was in Moses' hand. And if God can use a stick What does he want to do with what you have? With the talents and the abilities that you have. Think about that stick with me for a moment. Think about that staff. I don't know how many days or weeks or months or years Moses had been using that same rod. And it was of no consequence. He walked with it. He herded the sheep with it. It was just a dirty, unremarkable stick until God said, what's in your hand, Moses? And he made it the object of almighty power. And you are here this morning. You say, well, preacher, I don't have anything. I can't you do anything. God's not going to use me. Listen, you might not have anything. You might not be worth anything. But if almighty God decides to come down and make himself mighty and powerful through you, listen, it's unbelievable. It's not about you. 
But God has given us all gifts. God has given us all abilities and talents. And he desires for us to be good managers of them. He wants to use them. And if God can use the stick of Moses, he can use you. And so we've got to manage our time, our talent, and finally, our treasure. Jesus said, if you are faithful in little things, you will be faithful in large ones. But if you are dishonest in little things, you won't be honest with greater responsibilities. If you are untrustworthy about worldly wealth, who will trust you with the true riches of heaven? And if you are not faithful with other people's things, why should you be trusted with things of your own? I was thinking about that and I was thinking, isn't that the way that our parents are with us? Think about when you start driving. A lot of times, you don't start driving your own car, right? You start driving your parents. And then your parents, they, if, if my parents did this with me and I did it with my kids, they start teaching you how to treat their car, right? Listen, if you borrow the car, you gotta fill it up. If you borrow the car, don't leave it a mess. Why? Because it's not wise to entrust, well, it's not wise to entrust a teenager with anything, but it's not wise <laughs> to entrust a teenager with their own car if they haven't been trained and they haven't proven some level of responsibility with the parent's car. Remember when I was a little kid, me and my brother, we'd get in the garage. My dad always had wood and different materials around and nails and screws and he had a lot of tools. And sometimes he'd be gone at work and me and my brother get big ideas. Great, I mean great ideas. We had some great ideas. The, 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 um, the application of those ideas, not always so great um, or ever really very great, but uh, I mean, we had some great ideas. And we'd build things and we'd put things together. We'd make forts. We used to have a wood stove when I was a kid growing up. We'd burn a lot of wood. And, and me and my brothers, would, we moved this whole wood pile and made this frame and then hit it with the wood file pile and created this fort. Very sanitary situation, I'm sure, but it was great. Probably not real safe either, you know. We got all these logs stacked up on top of this, but man, it was awesome. But I remember my dad would be very particular about his tools. Remember one time he found a hammer out in the yard after being there for several days. This really seemed to bother him. My recollection. Um, it, it previously had just been kind of a wooden handle, a steel head. And we had introduced the aspect now of rust to the hammer. He's pretty irritated. Why? Because those were his tools. And he taught us how to use them, how to care for them, the way they should be put up. Remember later I got a car and was working on it. My dad called me in and opened the drawer and there was a socket set and he said, look at these sockets. Look how greasy and oily and dirty they are. And I'm thinking, yeah, look at my hands, look at my car. He's like, no, you gotta wipe them down. I don't want them left like that. And so I learned that. And if you go to my shop today and you open up the drawer, guess what? For the most part, the wrenches and the sockets are pretty clean mostly because I don't use them, but also because <laughs> what I do, I wipe them down. Because why should I be entrusted with my own things if I can't care for the things of others? And God has told us that he owns everything. And if we're not faithful in little things, how can we be faithful in big things? And sometimes we can be frustrated because we can think, God, I've got this big vision and I want you to let me do big things. And God says, just do this little thing. And you think, no, I want to do the big thing. 
But God said, if you can't do the little thing, how can I let you be responsible for the big thing? So we need to use our worldly resources. Not only that, we do need to be good managers. For the earth is the Lord's, 1 Corinthians 10, 26 says, and everything in it. It's a quote of Psalm 24 in verse one. Listen, God owns it all. And so we need to use it. And Jesus is telling his disciples, he's saying, listen, this guy is a shrewd manager. This guy was a dishonest manager. And when he was fired, he did a dishonest thing. And it's interesting what Jesus said. He said that the, the man of this world, the people of this world are more shrewd than the children of light. God is gonna ask you to manage things in a way that are different, that don't always make sense from what the world says. But God has a plan. That's why Jesus said in Luke chapter 12 and verse 15, beware, guard against every kind of greed. And then Jesus said this, life is not measured by how much you own. Life is not measured by how much you own. But listen, that's not what the world says. We make lists showing who has the most. Forbes publishes it every year. Who's the richest man in the world? Who's the rich, and, then, and we even break it down. We'll say, well, this is the richest person under 30. This is the richest person that, that's self-made. This is the richest person in, in this country, in that country, in this continent. I saw a list the other day. It listed the, the richest person in every state. And you know what I did? Read it. <laughs> I wanted to know who the richest guy in Colorado was. It's not me. They didn't list second, but I don't think I was there either. We look at those things, but Jesus said, life's not measured that way. That is not the measurement of whether you win or lose. That's not the measurement of whether you're successful or not. And to follow after Jesus means you're not gonna be as shrewd as the people of this world. You're not always gonna do the things the way other people do them. Rather, you're a manager of a different master. And that's what Jesus said. He said, no man can serve two masters. For you will hate one and love the other. You will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. See, it's interesting that the shrewd manager he knew exactly who he was serving, didn't he? Think about it. He was supposed to be serving his master, was he? No, he was dishonest. And when he was fired, who was he most concerned about? Did he say, man, I've really done my master wrong and in the last bit of accounting, I've gotta to try to do right by him? No. He said, I am too weak to dig ditches and I am too proud to beg and I'm gonna hatch me a scheming plan and I'm gonna figure out a way to take care of me. And Jesus said, people of this world are shrewd, but as children of light, that's not the master you're serving. And a big part of our problem is we bounce back and forth. We serve Jesus, but then we're real concerned about what we've got. We follow after eternal things, but I don't want to forget my bank account over here. So I want to conclude this morning with just a couple of questions. Number one, who do you serve? First John chapter five and verse 21 says, dear children, keep away from anything that might take God's place in your hearts. Listen, I'd encourage you this week, meditate on 1 John 5, 21. The Bible tells us to, to meditate on God's word and that's not, you know, you don't have to get in some weird position. It just really means to think about. I think about, I, I 
picture meditation is just kind of rolling something over in my mind. Keep away from anything that might take God's place in your hearts. I've spent some time meditating on that. That's convicting. Because there's a lot of things that I do that if I'm not careful can take the place of God in my life. Who is it that you serve? And then who or in what do you trust? Jesus said this in Matthew chapter six and verse 19. Don't store up treasures here on earth where moths eat them and rust destroys them and where thieves break in and steal. Store your treasures in heaven where moths and rust cannot destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. Wherever your treasure is, there the desire of your heart will be also. Where, where's your trust? Who do you serve and who do you trust? Habakkuk chapter two and verse nine says, what sorrow awaits you who would build big houses with money gained dishonesty, dishonestly. You believe your wealth will buy you security, putting your family's nest beyond the reach of danger. What sorrow awaits? We think we got it all together. Listen, I'm not saying we shouldn't plan for the future. I'm not saying we shouldn't be wise with our money. My wife and I save for the future. We save for retirement. We try to plan out things. But you know what the truth is? I can't control the future. I don't know what's gonna happen. And if my trust is in my 401k, I am in trouble. If my trust is in my bank account, or if my trust is in my ability to, to devise a plan or to make money or whatever it is, if my trust is in anything other than Almighty God, I'm in big trouble. And anyway, I shouldn't be working for this life. I need to be working for eternity. I shouldn't be so focused on what I have in this life. I want to be focused on eternity. Listen, I've told you before, I put time and attention and, and, and effort into the here and now. I do that at my house, I do that here. Do you know that the, the grass in the courtyard, I've struggled with this summer, have you noticed? How many of you noticed it turned brown? Liars, several of you have. What's that preacher doing all day? I couldn't figure it out. Someone turned the valve to the sprinkler system. I kept checking the box. I'm like, it's working. But it wasn't working. The water had been turned off. And it was a couple of weeks before I figured it out. I'm not the smartest guy. And the grass was turning brown, and it bothered me. Every time I'd drive by Kipling, I'd see the brown grass. Still a little brown, but the grass has been getting better for the last couple of weeks. I turned the water on. And now every time I walk by that sidewalk, I'm looking at those valves. I don't know who did it, but God will get you, but. <laughs> I'm just kidding. There's probably some kid playing around. Because I, I care how the grass looks. You say, well, preacher, you ought to be focused on eternal things. I should, but I want the church to look nice as well. I don't think that's wrong. I think the buildings that God has given to us, we need to be good stewards of them. But I'll tell you what, I want to be more focused on my eternal home. I want to be more focused on what God has for me in eternity. I want to use the resources that God has given me to benefit others and to have eternal value. Listen, I want our facilities to look nice and I want our grass to be green because when I don't want it, anything to distract when people come in here, I want them to be able to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ for eternal value. Not so I can go, hey, look how great our church looks. Who cares? Someday this building won't be here. I hope it's not tomorrow, but someday it won't be here. That's not what has eternal value. It's those who hear 
about Jesus, those who come to know him as savior, those lives that are changed, that's what has eternal value. And that needs to be the, the focus that we have as a church and as individuals. And that doesn't always line up with the way other people live. And sometimes that's gonna mean you do things that don't always make sense. Listen, when you take a week's vacation and instead of going somewhere to a resort, you'd spend that time on a mission trip, that doesn't make sense. When you take resources and money that you have that you earned hard and you give them to the church when that money could go to other things, that doesn't make sense. And the world looks at that and thinks, that's a waste. But our focus needs to be eternal. And God has given all of us time and talent and treasure and how we manage those has eternal significance. And so let us learn the, the lesson that Jesus had for his disciples not to emulate the wicked steward, but to learn that we don't live that way. We are men and women whose citizenship is in eternity. Let us be managers who are focused on eternity. To God, Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your word. God, and I thank you for all that you have given to us. Lord, you certainly bless us more than we deserve. Even in our need, God, we know that your blessings to us are great. You give us the breath in our lungs. You give us family and friends. You, you've bestowed so many blessings to us, God. But help us not to be focused on the blessings. Help us to be good managers of all that you've entrusted to us. Focused on eternal things. Things that have everlasting value. God, help us to manage our time, our talent, our treasures in a way that would be pleasing to you. Not for our benefit, God, but for eternity's benefit. Lord, help us to take the lesson of the, the wicked or the shrewd manager to learn from it and to seek to be managers that you would be pleased with. In Christ Jesus' name we pray, amen.